Welcome to the 3030 Health Podcast. The following discussion is for education and entertainment. It is not intended to diagnose or treat disease. Please do not apply any of this information without first discussing it with your doctor. Here is your host, Guillermo Ruiz. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 3030 Health Podcast. Today's guest is Dr. Richard Marr. He is a licensed naturopathic doctor who, after practicing in a primary care setting for over 20 years, now provides a unique perspective on metabolic health and recovery. Dr. Marr puts his patients in the driver's seat of health and wellness, helping them decode blood test results to find the diet and fitness habits that reverse and prevent type 2 diabetes, weight gain, and hypothyroid problems. The 3030 Health Podcast keeps growing every week. If you're a new listener, head over to 3030strong.com and download the free ebook, The Top Supplements for Your Natural Medicine Cabinet. Thank you for listening. Here's the show. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to have Dr. Richard Marr as my guest today. Dr. Marr, how are you doing? Guillermo, it's a pleasure to be here. Doing great. So, you know, for anyone out there that uh, has not been to the past, how many paleo effects have you presented at? Um, this year was my fourth year. Uh, <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's the sixth year that paleo effects took place. So I'm, uh, I'm fortunate to be, um, you know, seeing it through its evolution in its own little you know, six year, seven year history. And so for, um, for anyone that might not be familiar with the paleo movement, you know, because you were such a strong force within it, um, can you tell us your hero story? How did you arrive to become a naturopathic uh, doctor and, and in this paleo uh, space? Yeah, good question. And um, if you had looked at me 25 years ago, I was pretty far from paleo. Like, like a lot of people, mine is a journey. Um, I started asking the first question when I was in 1985 in my first college nutrition class. And uh, I took the class uh, not because it was part of my degree, because my degree was music performance, but I took a course in nutrition and I wanted to know what is a healthy diet. It's probably that simple a question. And that question has bugged me now for 32 years. Fortunately, about five you know, five to 10 years ago, I stopped asking the question. I realized the question wasn't correct. There is no healthy diet. Um, there's a healthy you and you have to figure out what that, what that is dietarily, lifestyle, fitness, what it is that makes it come together. So I started asking the question, what is it that helps this person in front of me if I'm in clinical practice or what is it that helps me as an individual and you know, of course, writing my first book, what is it that helps? What is it that can help other people discover what I've discovered in my own life and what I help uh, thousands of other people discover in clinical practice? You know, they, so many things to dissect on that little intro. You know, for example, number one, what is a healthy diet? And when a patient comes to a clinic in, in any world, you know, whether it's the, uh, in any of the aspects of the medical world, what ends up happening is that on the discharge papers, they'll have eat a healthy diet. And now that person that might have type 2 diabetes, that might have hypercholesterolemia, that might have, you know, any disease process that you can think of because it's included in the plan. Now they're going to try to go find their healthy diet and we let them go out on their own. They walk into the supermarket and who's doing the education now? General Mills, Kellogg's. Uh, Dr. Google, you know, Monsanto, all these people that have, you know, that maybe have a monetary incentive to try to make them eat a certain way. Second, when, when you ask someone or, or when someone asks me, uh, you know, what should I eat? And my answer is, it depends. People are get, get really turned off by that because they want strict, solid guidelines. You know, and, and it turns out that depend, it's going to be a continuum and your diet should change as your health changes. I love your point where people will get discharged with something as simple as eat a healthy diet. Um, and it's, it's insane when somebody says in their intake, they'll often say to me, um, oh, I have a really healthy diet. 
it, that doesn't it doesn't mean a thing to me what's what's exciting to me about the world of science and um the world i live in as a physician and as a a sort of constantly interested life learner science allows me to let go of meaning you know i i i have to believe that what i currently know may not be true and that everything i'm i'm putting together may not be together for the reasons i think they're together you know i may be i may be putting cause and effect in place where it doesn't belong um so with that freedom it allows me to ask better questions i'm constantly asking better questions you know is a uh, is eating a high fat diet healthy for us your answer is perfect it depends it depends <laughs> is, it, is eating a low carb diet healthy it depends um I haven't found a place where eating a very high carb diet is healthy for anyone, but um, uh, maybe I'll still in my mind say, well, it depends. I just haven't figured out what the it is and it depends. <laughs> um, it's exciting to, to start to take this apart and figure out for everybody, um, you know, where is your answer? And that's the beauty of this movement, whatever you want to call it, evolutionarily, uh, paleo, uh, biohacking, which is not my favorite term, you know, it's it's so exciting because w the people within the movement understand science. And if tomorrow I contradict what I wrote on a blog three or four years ago, people are not going to call me a flip flopper. People are going to dissect the data and make their own decision. And that is empowering. As it should be. And, uh, you yeah, know, I, I have a tough time naming this too. Is it I certainly don't think paleo sticks, but, um, you know, I think I take an ancestral perspective on health and wellness. And through that, that allows me to see what's going on in the body is not a, a broken mutation, but as a brilliant adaptation. That's empowering in itself. It's very empowering. I, I really appreciated hearing. Um, sometimes I feel like I'm an island when I'm in my own um, integrative medicine profession and people are getting really excited about treating patients for the mutation of MTHFR. Um, and I just think it's hogwash to a large degree that, that this mutation, as you call it, since it's so ubiquitous in populations around the world, is probably there for a damn good reason. We just are too ignorant to know what it is, to arrogantly call it a a disruptive mutation that needs treatment is arrogance beyond our human form. Um, I have to look at these things with an ancestral eye that maybe this is happening for a really good reason. So when I see someone with high blood sugar in my office, I'm not saying, oh, you have prediabetes or you've reached type 2 diabetes. I'm saying, this is incredible. Your body is able to store extra sugars and leave extra sugars behind so that you can make it between meals. How long do you go between meals? And they'll say, well, my doctor's office told me to eat every two to three hours. And I'm able to say, well, that's crazy because your body's so good at leaving plenty of sugar in your bloodstream without food. So very clearly what you need is two meals a day. And the studies prove that, right? The, there's some great research on, you know, coming from Prague, there was that wonderful study showing that uh, equal caloric intake at three meals a day worked less well than two meals a day. So people ate at 10 o'clock and at six o'clock, and it was a thousand calories at each meal, and they were both maintaining 2,000 calorie diets. For type two diabetes, this was a great landmark study. And when you inform, when you actually use your dossere title, the, the doctor as teacher, and you explain what's going on, there's almost like a sense of relief that they, it, the patient now is empowered. How do you, okay, that in, in the name of your book is The Block Code. How do you use lab results in a very sophisticated way to actually diagnose and treat a patient uh, in, in, in this functional medicine world. And then second, if you had to have one piece of equipment that you can have at home, what would it be? Oh, that's a good question, Guillermo. I'll answer the first part because I'll need time for the second. Um, 
the uh, blood tests are really quite simple. You know, the I I didn't write a book, the blood code, and include advanced uh, genetic cancer markers. Uh, we're really looking at how well we store and burn the foods we're eating and really using glucose and carbohydrates as the, the marker here. So if your glucose is high, is your body storing that or burning it? Well, I can look at triglycerides, which is the storage form of fat that our body is building from those glucose chains. So we can build triglycerides as a storage form of energy or calories. And um, if we have a high triglyceride and a high glucose, it means we're erring on the side of storing too much. Every time we eat, we're sending a storage message to our body. So when I break apart blood glucose and triglycerides and then have everyone measure the hormone insulin on a fasting sample, I can look at how well is your body storing and or how well is your body burning. It's, it's simple. I just wrote an article that'll be up on that paleo blog and it's on the blood code um, in the blog section right now called how thin is too thin because I can use the same blood tests. I can use the same blood code book um, to see whether someone has taken their leanness too far, say a long distance runner who's gone low carb, high fat and um, is doing periodic fasting. Probably not a great idea for that person if they hit too lean. So where do they get? You and I know all the press is going for the, the overweight couch potato, right? That's, they're, they're, they're setting up this narrative saying, oh, the people who get high blood sugar are uh, lazy and they're um, overweight and making bad choices. And I don't know how many type 2 diabetics you've seen, but that narrative is wrong well over half the time. You know, these people are not overweight. They're not making any worse choices than anyone else, yet their sugar's high. So it's it's teaching them what those, even just those three blood tests, the glucose, the insulin, and the triglyceride, what it means related to their storage and their burning. And then we can hack, we can hack our lifestyle to correct that. So the, the blood code is using some simple blood tests to navigate a little bit of meaning in our lives in terms of what's happening when we're eating and are we really in that sweet spot where we're burning equal to our storage we're not running a surplus and okay so let's dig into that into that last uh, uh point that you made about the thin person that might be type 2 diabetic that's such an interesting uh, paradox i don't know you know because at least the unhealthy looking uh quotation marks the unhealthy looking person that has some insulin resistance, you, you, you know, you're going to see the overweight picture, you know, diseases of civilization, metabolic syndrome kind of a thing. And having that conversation with them, you got to change the way you eat is going to be uh, it, the, the, going from point A to point B is going to be easier. But when you have someone as lean as you, and I want you to tell your story uh, that, that has some insulin resistance, okay? And, and now you're telling this person, okay, you need to stop drinking soda. You need to stop eating donuts. And that person comes back at you and says, I'm thin. I don't know what you're talking about. But their insides are just a mess. Okay, so what, uh, what are some symptoms for those out there that might be on the leaner side? But uh, what are some symptoms? And could you tell us your story about uh, your family? And uh... That's good. No, good question. Um... You know, it's a shame that, uh, you know, just this spring I had a rush of patients in my office and it's a shame what their symptom was, was a heart attack. Huh. Uh, so, you know, these are 50 year old, 48 year old, 52 year old men who have their first heart attack, even though they're cycling uh, 2,500 miles a year. Hmm. You know, they're they're on their bikes. They're regularly doing aerobic exercise. Um but what they're doing to fuel their aerobic exercise is carbohydrates. You know, they're, they're using gel packs, perhaps. They're, um, you know, they're pushing their, their glucose loads um, inadvertently while exercising incorrectly. They're not recovering. So, um, you know, myself, I'm, 
I'm from a family of marathon runners. So we all tend to look, we used to, I used to look at long distance exercise as the, you know, the pinnacle of health, you know, that was the grand dom of, of fitness. I also have a strong family history of type two diabetes, you know, two grandparents sides. Um, by the time I was around 43, my blood sugars were going up. Now there's not really a symptom for that. You know, I, if my blood sugar, if my A1C reaches 6.0, so I'm halfway through diabetes towards type two, you know, below 5.7 is normal and above 6.4, 6.4 is type two diabetes. And I reach about 6.0. I didn't feel any worse. I did have a little, um, every now and then I'd get a little tinea. It's actually a yeast infection in the skin. When I lived in Portland, Oregon, back in naturopathic school, boy, I had tinea versicolor all over my body. But I was blaming that on the fact that the sun didn't shine for about 45 days straight, one February and March. It was enough to drive me crazy. Um, so I blamed my tinea on that. Fact is, it was probably high blood sugar that was getting pushed into my tissues. So I didn't really have anything wrong with me. I got sick more than I do now. Now I I get a cold maybe once every three, four years. Um, I just don't get sick anymore. Um, in part, I think that's just what a lot of people experience when they're on a, a cleaner, low carb, high fat diet. There's not a lot of if very, very few sugars that come into my diet. And it's not by strenuous rule, but it just works that way. Um, so I just, I ran blood tests on myself. I put my money where my own mouth is. and. You know, I ran my own little discovery panel to see whether I was low in something. And it opened my eyes to look at my blood sugar and say, what's going on? My cholesterol was always on the low side, but it turned out my good cholesterol wasn't very high. It was only 50s to 60s. Hmm. Which is, which is a, on a regular person, they would be like, wow, your cholesterol is 50, your HDL is 56, bravo. But we know that we want that number higher. Right. So now I get, I got my, and my triglyceride was never very high. I'm from a family that gets diabetes without high insulin. So my triglycerides never go up and that's why I don't gain body fat. But what happens is I'm, I tend towards more insulin resistance in my tissues. So for me, um, I needed to gain a little bit more muscle mass. I needed to lower my carbohydrate intake, stop eating fruits, lose the bread. And ultimately my and changing my exercise. I did more weightlifting, not a lot, but, you know, a couple of times a week, making sure I had a good weightlifting routine in my, you know, as my workout. And uh, my HDLs went from the 50s up to the 80s. Uh, my triglyceride went down, staying around the 60s, 50s to 60s. Um, so my cholesterol actually went up, but it was all from the good cholesterol going up 30 points. That was brilliant. It's, I'm, I've never been healthier. And uh, my, tr my cholesterol is now a little above 200, which is fabulous. I, I feel the best in my life. Um, and my A1C and my blood sugars have all corrected. So now my fasting blood sugars are better. So it's really understanding. It's no surprise to me. My mother was type 2 diabetic at 60 years old. Um, you know, I have a strong lineage that it's expected that I carry the same trait. Again, it's not a disease, right? It's, it's an adaptation. It's a, It's an adaptation. It's brilliant for uh, for the type of lifestyle that my great grandmother lived, and uh, which is a a lifestyle that has you know uh, over the winters maybe not a lot of carbohydrate availability. Correct. It was um you know I was actually uh, you're asking me I was just in my great grandmother's homeland in uh, Sicily about two weeks ago, and uh, there's an island north of Sicily. There's this archipelago. Um, And we were on the island of Salina, beautiful Aeolian islands, these volcanoes that form these fascinating seven islands. Um, and the, the login, the password to the B&B &B we stayed in was uh, uh, Salire Sempre, which, which means always uphill. Huh. <laughs> you know, you can't live there and not basically walk straight up all the time and straight down all the time. And you're doing that with rocks the 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 volcano i climbed with my daughter three quarters of the way up this steep hill slope it was all rock terraces that were built probably in the 16 1700s 
these humans lived very, very challenging lives. <laughs> yeah, uh, just um, difficult aerobic, anaerobic activity. And they were eating capers, olive oil, and oily fish. That was their entire mealscape. So yes, very few carbohydrates. And the fact is also very little food. They, they went through periods of fasting quite regularly, but still had to move rocks up hills. So the adaptation is to try to conserve as much energy as possible. Precisely. So if I can store and preserve capital, if I can store more while eating less, works great. It all falls apart when I'm no longer carrying rocks, rocks uphill and I'm eating a lot. Now my body's still going to store more with what it gets. Um, and in my case, it, it'll store it in the wrong places. It'll store high blood sugars. It'll get fatty liver. So now, uh, with this with this patient that is the, in, on the skinny side, but might be uh, insulin resistant. Okay, if anyone suspects to have this type of of uh, inclination in their uh, food storage, uh, how can they talk to their practitioner, or what are you looking for in their labs? I think the um, the first thing I can have people look for is something that everyone has already had tested. And that is that triglyceride HDL ratio. It should be one to one. For athletes and people who are you know, healthy and on the leaner side, it'll be less than one. It'll be between 0.5 and one. But anywhere between 0.5 and 1.5, it's good. And that tells, it tells me you're not storing too much. When the triglycerides are high, most physicians ignore it because they're so fixated on the cholesterol that they look right over the triglyceride HDL. And that's actually a more telling number. And it's a standalone risk factor of heart attack and stroke. You know, incredibly valuable number set. So just to have people look at their lipid panel, any, anyone who has it can look right below the cholesterol and that's where the HDL and the triglyceride will be. Okay, you know what? Let's, let's do something uh, fun. Let's go through each one of the lipoproteins and just do a quick recap for those people that are, might not be in medical school <laughs> uh, and, and to, uh, just to go over what they mean. So let's start with HDL. HDL is the cholesterol that um, is always referred to as the good cholesterol. These high density lipoproteins, HDL, and it is a, it is a type of cholesterol. Um, these are the guys that are produced in the liver when we're measuring a fasting blood lipid panel, we're measuring not what you've eaten, but what your liver is producing. And if it's producing an adequate and pl plentiful HDL content, these tend to be the cholesterol molecules that go and clean up the um, pipes and tubes. They clean up the roadways of our body. Okay. And then next we have the LDL, you know, people refer to la lousy lipoprotein. Right. Low density lipoprotein. And yeah, the bad lipoprotein. These are the bad cholesterol. I, I always hate passing this like oversimplistic moral judgment on <laughs> Yeah, because it's so necessary. Because <laughs> cholesterol is also, all these cholesterols and the LDLs, they can be transferred into our sex and steroid hormone pathways, right? Our cholesterol is the building block of cortisol, you know, our very response to stress. It's our building block to testosterone and progesterone and estrogen. Um, no surprise when people are under extraordinary amounts of stress, what do you think their cholesterol does? Goes up a little bit. It'll often go up over time if it's sustained because your body needs a few extra two by fours to put an addition on the house, right? It just needs to build more testosterone, more DHEA. So we'll see that higher cholesterol level. The LDL cholesterol does tend to make up more of the plaques compared to HDLs. So we call them bad for that reason. We're not going to get in this podcast to LDL A pattern versus B pattern and angstrom size. So um, there are also good LDLs and um, less good, as we know. And, uh, and then your triglycerides. Triglycerides are long chain fats that our body can use as energy. So these are a very efficient way of storing nine calories per gram unit of fuel. So our body, when we eat 
fatty foods, animal fat, saturated fats, we're getting triglycerides, but we also make a majority, especially on a morning fasting blood glucose, a blood lipid panel. It's telling us what your body is actually producing for fats. So are you a fat producer or are you a fat burner? And then it gets complicated because things like fructose, before we can utilize it as a as a uh, as a form of energy, they have to be converted into triglycerides. All in the liver. In the liver, There's, yeah. In the liver, so it, it becomes a problem. And uh, yes, that's um. And and that's why you have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease because people that are over consuming sugars, uh, to the point that they have to be converted into fat for long-term storage, and they get, they just get saturated in the liver. Correct. And it is not just overweight, obese people that develop this. Uh, I see a tremendous number of lean people with fatty liver disease, in large part because of sugar intake, but also just not checking an insulin level. So that's that other test that I ask people to beg their doctor to run. Many of them won't do it because they're unfamiliar with it. But um, an insulin test only costs about $20 if you have to pay for it at a lab. So really important to get that fasting insulin. Okay, and what, what information are you getting? What's, what's the value of a fasting insulin? If an insulin is below three or four, that means your body is not storing sugars as fat very effectively, which is good if you're trying to get lean, right? If your insulin is above eight, certainly if it's above 10, that means your body is a real good storer. You know, it's, store, it's able to store calories very effectively. So if you take someone with an insulin of 10 fasting and you give them oatmeal with a banana and a little glass of pomegranate juice for breakfast, you're going to send that insulin really high. You're going to be a fat producer for the next three, four hours. It doesn't matter whether that meal had no fat in it. Your body is just a fat making machine. So, you know, the concept of eating low fat to prevent our bodies from making fat or having fat on it is, as you and I know from, you know, from everything that science has taught us over the past 10 years, um, that is just so untrue. So it's a matter of knowing that insulin gives us the answer as to whether we're going to be a fat producer or not. Where I become uh, kind of uh, really upset, at, at, you know, in some cases, and uh, one of the biggest things that I, you know, that one of the problems within medicine in general is that you can have this person come in, you run some labs, and let's say their cholesterol is in the 400s we automatically want to chalk that up to, oh, it's genetic. And it might be, you know, just to try to mitigate some of the responsibility from the patient and maybe uh, not give uh, blame to the patient. But in reality, you know, genetic hypercholesterolemia, it's in the 800s. Uh, and a level of like 400 can be corrected with habits. And then... If you were to ask that patient, does your family have a history of ha uh, hypercholesterol anemia? They'll say, yeah. So then they'll chalk it up to genetic. When in reality, what's happening is that, yeah, maybe they are of this storing fat genotype. And that's why you, you're seeing this reproduce over many generations. So what happened first, the genetic uh, 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 predisposition or B, the faulty habits? And, and you know, and and that's where the science and the and the the religion of dieting becomes really uh, important in the differentiation. Because if I'm I have a person who looks healthy, who uh, who appears to have good insulin sensitivity, appears, and then I run those labs, and their cholesterol is in the two forties, there is some room for improvement, and we can titrate things or we can change certain things to help that person become better but in our very uh biased way if i we see a person that's healthy and then we go in in, in their their cholesterol levels and their cholesterol levels are in the 240s maybe their o1c was on the six and that's something that you did you were not happy with that result so instead of being biased and say well excuse it in some way 
you actually went in and you changed your habits to optimize your, your labs. And that is so important for future practitioners or practitioners that are listening to this show that if you find something incidental, we need to pursue it. We just, the, the problem is that we don't have the tools to learn how to fix those deviations. Right. So yeah, there's two things I'd touch on for your listeners. One is, um, if there are no other risk factors, if I've run a coronary calcium score and it comes back at, you know, single digits or zero, or if I've run an LDL subfraction and they tend to have the A patterns and, you know, I, but if I, if I look at these other risk factors, triglyceride HDL is close to one to one for men, I'm comfortable with a total cholesterol up around 280 for women up around 310. Beyond that, it's high cholesterol, and I want to see it turn around, just to below those numbers. So my threshold numbers are sort of based on uh, Dr. Abramson's work and Stephanie Seneff's work and um, some really great uh, people who compile and write about the, the research related to cholesterol. Um, so even identifying high cholesterol is sort of like identifying a healthy diet. What is it? What does it mean? You know, we have to take that apart. So in what context? Right, right. So we have to because you could have a cholesterol of 220, but if your if your scan, your coronary uh, exam, you know, uh, is super calcified, then we might have a problem. Then I don't care. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I, I you you bring up a good point about the um, the blaming genetics. The fact is, almost everyone who's 19 percent of all type 2 diabetics in the U.S. are built lean or thin like me. Uh, in most Asia, Asian countries, China is now higher in diabetes and prediabetes than we are. They're 50.1% as of 2016. And they have a higher proportion of those people who are lean. They're at mid to lean BMIs. So what happens in clinical practice Soon as someone's overweight, comes in with high blood sugars, their doctor's going to blame them on being slovenly in their lifestyle and diet. Someone like me shows up. I show them the high blood sugars and the high A1C. What do they say? Oh, must, must be genetic. Must be genetic. It's so biased. You know, I'm being, uh, I'm being profiled based on my body size that there's a whole set of things going on. And if there are any practitioners listening who can challenge themselves because we all profile that's actually what we're good at after 25 years of clinical practice i'm really good at profiling i can look at someone and i'm gauging whether there's mental illness there i'm gauging whether there's um uh physical trauma i'm gauging all sorts of things in the first three seconds I see them. You shake their hand and you... you I get so much information. You I'm start hoping. thinking of a differential diagnosis. So I have what I have to do, though, is know that while I can be really good at those profiles, um, my best profiling day, I might only bat around 60%. You know, that's better than flipping a coin, but it's really crappy medicine. Right. I can't I can't treat based on that. So we have to always challenge our conclusions. And when we see someone who's lean or overweight, let, let's not throw one of those throwaway terms at them. You know, it's, it's genetic or um, it's may, maybe maybe you took your labs and you weren't fasting like you automatically begin to make excuses for the results. Exactly. And I've seen this numerous, numerous times and I've had medical colleagues here actually see my results and say, lab must have done something wrong. And I'm looking at him, this is a friend of mine, he's an orthopedic surgeon, and he admits that he hasn't even thought of endocrinology for the past 20 years and wouldn't know what to do with a thyroid or where it is in the body. Um, you know, he's just been doing knees and hips and shoulders all his life. Um, so it's, it's funny to hear someone in the medical field just so quickly say exactly that. It, the lab must have made an error. There's no way. He's looking at me and saying, there's no way. Well, of course there's a way. My mother had this. This is, it's totally a way. Oh, you know, another big one, uh, white coat syndrome. 
you know, uh, someone shows up to your practice and this is like their third or fourth follow up. And every time they get a higher blood pressure and then you, they look pretty healthy and you, oh, it's probably white coat syndrome or the patient itself will tell you, I have white coat syndrome. How irresponsible is that? Right. So we, we tease these apart. You know, I never blame anything on anything. All, my job is to teach, you know, and if I'm going to quickly blame something that's happening to someone based on what they're doing. I, I, again, like I said, in science, my cause and effect narrative is likely going to be proven to be wrong over the next hundred years. I may not be here to see it proven wrong, but I'd be better to inform somebody of what's happening and to pivot off of that and then have some method where we can recheck whether things are better. Ultimately, our goal is to see things in this improvement direction. I had somebody, had somebody just see me today who um, was referred by an osteopathic physician in town, and um, she had gained 70 pounds after going vegan. She went vegan to lose weight. Everyone's saying, hey, you just, you're just overeating. You're stuck in an overeating thing. You should go to a medical clinic um, and get amphetamines or something to suppress your appetite. I saw her, and she was one of these people who had a high insulin, and she was eating three bananas a day. This is crushing her. So getting her off of this diet will be the next challenge. But I don't have her believing that my diet's better than so-and-so's diet. I just, I'm looking at the objective truth of what's happening. And we're able to, in this case, I said, I want you to retest these things in six weeks because I knew she's going to be in disbelief. So in a short period of time, we're going to run another test to see whether that triglyceride drops. You know, how quickly will that happen? And I do skinfold calipers. You know, I'm using this torture device on people, you know, pinching four locations on the body. And, you know, those changes happen within, you know, within three, four weeks, but they're millimeter changes. So no one will know it's happening unless they see it. And that's why I have people come back in and I can look at those skinfold measurements and say, hey, you've, you've lost four millimeters at your hip already and two millimeters on your back it's not a lot but you are going in the right direction that's where i was going with what's the number one instrument you could have at your house because i i've actually you know like uh we talked at uh, paleo effects and my school gave away you know uh skinfold calipers and it's basically because of you because i use them in practice you know to track those little things. And, and Charles Spolican has been using calipers for a very long uh, long time. And uh, it, it is such an underutilized tool. And what's funny is that the skinful calipers, you know, of course, the more you spend on them, the better, the more accurate it's going to be. But sometimes you just need that baseline measurement done by the same person on the same points. And it might not be the best, but it, as long as it's consistent data, it's going to give you good data. Absolutely. So, I mean, this is one of those, uh, I think this unit here, um, Slim Guide is the, folk, uh, the folks that make it. Um, it's about 10 or $11. So this is an incredibly accurate tool for what it is. And, uh, you know, for 10 bucks, that's a cheap piece of electronics. Um, yeah, I can get fancier with heart rate variability and heart rate monitors and uh, teach people to do HRRs and HRVs, that gets clumsier. I think the easiest to approach is say, just if you're going to start a diet, check your hip, the beginning and at the end of it and have someone check your tricep. I have the instructions at the, at the bloodcode.com website and someone goes there, they can look into that. Let's go into that. You know, uh, what is the usability of of this skin calipers for uh, fat, you know, uh, how, how do you use it uh, in your practice and why is it important, you know, just like uh, fasting insulin is important, how is it, why is it important to keep track of that measurement? Mostly because um, if I have somebody uh, who has high insulin, insulin is an anabolic hormone. It builds tissue, mm -hmm. right? It is, it is anabolic. That is what it knows. It knows how to build. So if you have a lot of glucose and you're not activating your growth hormones, then it's going to build fat. But if you lower your glucose, if you lower your carbohydrate intake, and you're starting to put 
strenuous exertion on your body, you're putting your muscles in under strain, high insulin is going to trigger muscle gains. You're going to build mass. So when I have someone stand on a scale, they'll get frustrated because they'll say, I only lost one pound. All I've been doing for the past six weeks, I can't believe I've lost one pound. Yet I'll do the calipers and say, are you kidding me? You lost 4% body fat. You know, at a 140-pound person, that's six pounds of sheer fat. You know, would you like me to show you what that looks like? You know, that is a little, you know, basketball of body fat. And that's gone. And then I'll say, there's no way, you know, putting a, put, clipping a bra on or putting a short sleeve shirt on, there's no way you don't notice things fitting differently. And then people will say, oh, yeah, I did notice that. But they write it off. They're they're fixated on what the scale's telling them, not what the truth is. Or you know, or you can have you know the uh, the other type of patient. You know, the 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 patient that is like maybe not skeptic but self defeating. And you'll say that they'll come see you, and and then and then they'll and then you mesh you weigh them, and you say, oh, you've lost six pounds, and they'll immediately go, it's probably water weight. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and you know, and losing water weight in itself is a good thing because it it protects your kidneys and you know blah blah blah. But then if you have that that uh, 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 objective measurement of body fat and you can demonstrate that what you they they are doing, their habits are paying off. Now you get more compliance. Now you get more buy-in, and now you know they can see the actual results of their hard work. And and what's the result we're looking for? You know, I have to remind people, I'm, we could have your bones lose some of their density and you will lose about five to eight pounds. You'll be osteopenic, but you'll be five to eight pounds lighter. Or I could have you lose some muscle mass. You know, those people that go through like uh, chemotherapy or, you know, some maybe under a real stressful circumstance post-surgery or someone's gone through an awful divorce. They'll say, yeah, I lost 20 pounds. But if you look at them, it's not the kind of... 20 pounds you go up to and say, God, you look fabulous. Congratulations. Yeah. You, you, you go up to them and you sort of shake their hand cautiously because you don't want to break anything. Um, even the untrained eye knows the difference between muscle loss and fat loss. And we really want to maintain muscle gains. I'll ask somebody if, do you want to lose muscle? If you want to lose total mass, we'll go on a very low calorie diet and I'll lighten up on the strength workouts you're doing. And most, I haven't met anyone who says, no, I actually, I actually want to feel strong. Like, great. And stay off the scale because you've got a bias about what weight in numbers you think you should be. And I want you to be lean, strong and healthy. And that may not be the number you're pre-programmed to think is right. And that's why bringing in a metric that they're not familiar with, you know, skinfold calipers, that speaks a better truth. Yeah. And, and, and that's and that's the point. So how, how skinny is too skinny? How skinny is too skinny? It's, well, I'll run the simple. For men, I think below 10% body fat. And for women, below 15% body fat. And what happens when men or women get be, be, uh, below those points? Um, the body will tend to go catabolic. Mm. At that point, you're, you're getting close to your minimum fat needs. So your body just won't break into fats for energy. So when you're going four or five hours between meals, like overnight when you're sleeping, your body will actually break down protein structures. It'll break down serotonin and dopamine for energy. It'll do gluconeogenesis on those proteins. It'll, which, you know, serotonin and dopamine should be reserved for satisfaction and reward messages. Um, or we'll break down white blood cells, immunoglobulins, these proteins that can be turned into energy. Well, we don't want to turn our white blood cells into energy. We want to, we want to use them to fight off infections. So, so you know, I see this um, drop in body fat percentage. Uh, college kids, I see it often. Someone, you know, vegan is the new eating disorder. I, I didn't say that, did I? Uh, I think I did. And you know, there's. there's pressure, especially amongst girls and, uh, you know, young women in college. And what's the number one illness that strikes these college students? It's mono. You know, they just get knocked down by what is actually a very ubiquitous virus. It's, it's a virus that's always out there. It's just that vulnerability levels go so high in these college freshmen. It's not that they're all of a sudden living in close quarters. 
uh, it's it's something different. It's the vulnerable. And, uh, you know, and, and then uh, mental illness, you know, uh, the depression, you know, with low, you know, low cholesterol in women is correlated with higher incidence of suicide. This is, this is a serious thing, you know, and, and, but we are so enamored with the bikini body or the, you know, the washboard abs that we sometimes forget that there is a happy, healthy, you know, body fat percentage and body structure that might not be what's being publicized on magazines. Exactly. Right. And that's so it's preventing that catabolism that takes place. So body fat needs to be adequate. And it's, you know, someone can be on the lean side. You know, I myself will tend towards too lean. Um, if I stress too much and I don't eat enough, um, I will drop below 10% body fat. I pick it up pretty quickly. I know how that feels. Um, and I'll adjust my sleep. I'll adjust my diet. I'll adjust my exercise so that I get up to 12% or thereabouts. Um, still low, but that's a sweet spot for me. It's where I settle. It's not, I always want, I would love to be heavier. I live in Maine. I am cold all winter. So some insulation would be beautiful. <laughs> Dr. Marr, you know, what a great interview, you know, so happy to have reconnected with you. This is my third Paleo FX and every time I see you, it's like, oh man, there's, there's my friend, you know, it's uh, having just a familiar face. It feels so awesome. Uh, where can people find you and how can, uh, how can get, they, they get a hold on, of your blog posts and your uh, upcoming projects? Thank you. Um, they can go to thebloodcode.com. That's the uh, title of the first book and the website that holds it. And uh, if someone signs up for the, uh, just put your first name and email in, it's not a big business called The Blood Code that comes out of, um, you know, Vegas. It's me. Uh, so <laughs> any email that comes is going to be from me. And uh, if you sign up, you get that first 99 pages of The Blood Code, which allows you to understand all the blood tests and interpret them. And it'll come as a PDF. Um, so sign up, get the initial piece, and that'll you'll receive those infrequent newsletters from me, and it'll tell you what events are coming up or what the um, process is for the next book. And uh, and and something really cool about uh, your book is that it's very actionable, so you can read that, and and it gives you you know the pointers that if if you don't have a naturopathic doctor, if you don't have a functional medicine practitioner. Uh, to how to talk to a doctor in their doctor language on why you want this inexpensive labs. <laughs> this is yes. not the, you know, this is not a $400, you know, boutique uh, blood lab. No, this is like run of the mill, really simple that can help you guide you to see if you really need that $400 lab. Right. And very simple, you know, the, the lab panels, uh, the progress panel is under $100, and the discovery panel, which has all the extras, is around $174. And this is on Ulta. This is just going to a separate, separate direct lab, which is linked on the website. Some people buy the book for their doctor and then keep another copy for themselves. And, of course, authors don't write books to make money. So <laughs> whether someone buys two books or one isn't really my business, but... Uh, you know, the idea is to, you know, have your doctor as part of your decision making team. And the more we as patients can be part of that process um, and not roll over and have our belly rubbed. You know, the you know, the days of being submissive in our medical systems are over. So we really need to partner and be more active in the process with our physicians. And I think the blood code is one step towards having a tool to help interface and do that to help empower patients. That's the goal. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Marr. Uh, it, you know, it's been a pleasure, and uh, you know, I hope we uh, keep uh, sharing information and, and keeping up with uh, this education, not only of our patients, but also of our peers. Uh, it's always a pleasure to see you as part of the ancestral and naturopathic paths, and I know we'll see each other many times over the years. Awesome. Thank you so much. Pleasure, Guillermo. Bye-bye.